Today's topic of discussion is how to rescue a hand or a foot from some piece of implement or machinery. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you're notified of any future videos that we post. Leave us a like if you find this video helpful and leave us a comment below if you have any questions over any of the things we discussed today or if you just wanna say, hey, we love hearing from y'all. Today, we're gonna to be talking about rescue, but specifically rescue or removal of a hand or a foot from some type of implement or machinery. We've got a scaled down version here that we're gonna use for a demonstration. We've got a hand meat grinder and we've got some uh, poultry that we have gotten wedged up in there. But this could be a farm implement, this could be a much larger piece of machinery, but something that has now gotten a hand, a foot, a leg, an arm, something entangled inside, and now we've got to start working to be able to remove that person from this hazardous environment to be able to get them to surgery and definitive care. Now, just because we have a rescue that now needs to take place inside of our scenario or our patient care, doesn't mean that we get to skip over our assessment or any of the other life threats and dive right into this. If someone has their hands stuck in an implement, it's gonna look gnarly. You're gonna be drawn into that, but they may have other injuries as well, or they may be bleeding from here and we may need to apply a tourniquet before we start the rescue process. So don't skip over any of the basics. Whether you're using an NREMT type assessment for EMS or you're using the March algorithm, whatever your assessment tool is that you're working off of, make sure that we take care of those life threats before we start removing the patient from this hazard. All right, so we have our assessment done. We've checked for life threats. We've stopped any major bleeding. We're controlling the airway. We're ventilating if necessary. And we've done our full first assessment, gotten vitals, and now we are ready to move on to extracting the patient from the implement. First things first, we always wanna make sure our scene is secure. So this right here is a hand grinder, but if you have a powered piece of machinery, make sure that we shut that off. And in the fire service, we'll use something that's called lockout tag out. That means that we lock and tag all our equipment. So whether it's a um, elevator that's um, electrical or it's a gas powered piece of machinery, somehow we have locked and tagged that to make sure that no one tampers with it and there's no way that this can get turned back on while we're performing the rescue. Um, so if this is a piece of powered uh, machinery, we wanna make sure that the power is disconnected, disconnect the battery, cut the power. Um, we don't wanna just flip it off where someone can flip it back on. We wanna make sure that we're taking due diligence to make sure there is no way this can come back on while we're performing the rescue. Okay, so our scene is safe, our equipment is secured, lockout, tag out, or whatever system we use to make sure that this is not gonna come back on. We do our patient assessment, we take care of any life-threatening injuries. Now it's time to extract the patient from the machinery. Before we begin trying to pull, pry, cut, or anything to the machinery, let's take a minute to kind of analyze how the machinery is set up, um, what way everything progresses and moves through there. So if we were to reverse the process, what way is backwards, um, what kind of shafts, what kind of blades, um, what are the hazards and uh, mechanical motions that are now in here that the person is trapped in. Let's do a moment just to take a quick assessment, a quick survey and try to figure out how this machine works um, and where it's flowing through so we have a good idea of where the body part has gone to, what other entanglements may be down further in this piece of machinery. All right, so we've done a bit of assessment on our machinery now, and we know now, let's say this is a powered grinder. So we've disconnected our power, we've made sure there's no way that this can come back on through the process of our rescue. And now looking at this, um, the easiest and simplest way to get something out of here would be to disassemble this first. If we can disassemble this by removing bolts and nuts and screws and just take this apart, that's gonna be the simplest, safest, best way to get a person's hand out of this. And it's safest for the patient so that we're not uh, risking uh, cutting into them with a grinder or a saw, um, and it's gonna keep the patient safe. So even if we're gonna have to end up making some cuts, let's start disassembling and taking a look at this first. So I will take the handle off the back side. This will unscrew from the front. 
And we want to do this very carefully. We don't want any sudden jolts or movement because that may make the bleeding or the pain or the damage worse uh, to the extremity that's stuck inside. So everything's slow and methodical. Okay, so from here, I have taken apart as much as I can on this grinder. I can see up in there a little bit. Uh, we know that we've got flesh stuck down in this auger, but now I have a chance to look at the auger. I can see that there is an auger. I can see what the entrapment is from looking as much as possible, but I still have this shaft here that will not come undone. This auger is meant to slide out this way, but if I go to move it, I can see that the hand is moving and I don't want to do any further damage there. So we are going to uh, work on cutting this and this is the most invasive way to be able to get this out. So we only want to begin cutting next to a person's arm or foot or any part of a person when that's the last resort and that's the only thing that we can do now to be able to get this person free. We want to start by disassembling, unbolting, uh, moving as much as possible, but we don't want to make the injury any worse. So now we're going to resort to cutting. So as we begin cutting on this, I don't want to cut and then have to pry. Um, sometimes if it's sheet metal, that may be the option, make one cut and pry some sheet metal. This is pretty rigid, so we're gonna have to make a couple cuts here. So we're gonna have to make a cut down this side and this side to be able to cut through the top part. And then we're gonna have to go horizontally with a cut here and here. And then we should be able to remove this front L-shaped piece, lift that off and hopefully be able to get the patient's hand free from this implement. All right, we're about to begin cutting on this grinder, but a few things we need to keep in mind as well. We don't want the patient to get cut, and we don't want the patient to get burned from the friction that this cutting wheel is gonna have on this metal. So we want some sort of barrier between the patient and our cutting wheel, and we also wanna keep an eye on the temperature as well for this. So let's talk first about a barrier between the patient and where we're gonna be cutting. So I have a butter knife here, something cheap from the dollar store. Um, so you can use a hacksaw blade, you can use some thin pieces of metal, but you want some sort of barrier now, but you want some type of barrier. So when you cut through this implement or the metal that you're cutting, you don't wanna go any further into the patient. So you want an extra barrier on the inside. So I can take something like this and slide it down carefully in between the patient and where I'm going to be cutting. I can make my cut now directly in line with that. Same thing on the other side. And then I should be able to come in from the end and also slide it in there. And then I'm gonna be limited on where I can cut based on where I can get that uh, protection for the patient with my butter knife or whatever I'm using as that barrier. If there's any chance of any sparking or arcing, you wanna make sure you have no flammable hazards, uh, no chemicals or anything around. You also wanna cover the patient. Um, so if this is their hand that's stuck in here, cover their arm so you don't get any sparks or burns or anything back on their arm either. As far as temperature of the actual machine itself while we're cutting it, we want to mitigate that temperature by cooling it in some fashion. If you watched our uh, ring removal video, we talked about cutting things next to a person and a couple ways that we can uh, cool that down as we're cutting it. Uh, one way, especially for EMS professionals, is we can take an IV bag, we can put some IV drip tubing, we can open it up and just let it drip water on our work site as we're cutting to keep that water on there and keep it cool. Another way that we can do that is we can take a water bottle, we can poke a hole in the lid, we can screw that lid back on and now we can slow squeeze that water bottle and we get a nice little stream of water on the area where we're cutting. One advantage that firefighters and other uh, pre-hospital emergency providers may have is they may have access to a thermal camera. And so if you have a thermal camera, I can keep an eye on the cutting and make sure that the temperatures are well within uh, normal limits. We don't end up getting too hot as we're making that cut. So a thermal camera like this will allow you to be able to see differences in temperature. You can keep an eye on the patient, make sure that you are not doing any further damage to that patient as you're trying to make this rest. Well, enough talking, let's get in here and let's make this cut.
All right, so we made our cuts, we removed the top, and then we were able to get the hand and the auger out together, and then we were able to separate those once they were out. Um, remember to pick up any additional pieces of uh, the arm, fingers, anything else that may be in there. Um, you want to wrap those in some sterile dressings to try to keep them as clean as possible, stick them in a Ziploc bag or something. Um, you can also put those on ice to help try to cool them down, preserve them as much as possible. Um, you don't want them like directly in ice, but make sure that they're wrapped clean, kept in the Ziploc bag, and then ice around the bag uh, so you can keep them cool. Take them along with them to surgery, and then they will have as many options as possible to try to be able to put this back together as best as possible for the patient. Something to note as well, when we're making this cut on top, we want to make sure that we're cutting as efficient as possible and using as few of cuts as possible. The more cutting, the more chance we have to nick the patient, and we could also have a greater chance of potentially burning them um, as we're creating heat with those cuts. So if I had come up any higher with my cut here, I may still have been able to take the top off, but there might have been too much material still coming around the barrel here of this auger or of the uh, grinder so that I may not have been able to get the auger out. Then I would have had to make another cut and it's just more time, more delays, and more chance for injury to the patient. So take a good look during your assessment, figure out what can get hung up and where you need to make your cuts to make it as efficient as possible and safest for the patient. When you're doing an operation like this, this is a team effort. You're gonna need multiple people to make this happen. Anytime you're doing a rescue or anything technical, it's a good idea to have a second set of eyes just to watch and pay attention and make sure you're not missing something. And if they see something that you miss, they can stop you and say, hey, this is not gonna be safe. Let's take a look at this. Let's rethink what we're doing and let's try to make sure this is safest for us and the patient. Additional people would also be able to help hold uh, your barriers in place. Also be able to help spray water, uh, make sure that everything's staying cool, monitor the temperatures with a thermal camera if you have the luxury enough to have one of those that you can monitor um, and just be able to provide patient care reassurance to the patient that, hey, we're doing everything we can for you, um, try to stay still, all that kind of stuff. So this is definitely a team effort. I tried to make this happen just by myself for the sake of the video. I tried to use my uh, third hand there with a tripod set up to hold some water on this. Um, really, you need a little bit more forceful water or the water directly at the site where you're cutting. I was dripping it too high above. Um, some of the wind current from my saw blade was actually pushing the water so it didn't end up right where I wanted it. Um, I couldn't get my knife to stay in place just by balancing it. It would move with the vibrations. So typically I'll have someone holding this, someone else on water duty, someone on cutting, and then someone talking to the patient. You can then have an extra safety officer or somebody that's monitoring, making sure that everything is safe as you go through the process. Um, but at a minimum, you're going to need at least two or three people to make something like this happen. So if you want to try this at home, you can uh, spend some time practicing and honing your skills. You can find these hand grinders online for about 20 to $30. Just do an internet search for them, um, find some of these, order a couple, and then you can find either uh, chicken legs or parts of chicken um, to be able to pull down in this grinder. You can also use hog's feet. Hog's feet work great because it has skin around it still, um, so it contains it a little bit better than the chicken will. So if you can come up with some of those, those are great to use. Stick it down in there crank it down in there, get it stuck really well, um, and then start working on honing your skills to be able to make these cuts, make these rescues, and be able to start um, getting this free from the implement. All right, well, that's it for today. I hope this was helpful. Hope this helped you be able to think through the entire process of making a rescue and not just, oh, let's make a cut, but what do we need to do before the cut? What do we need to do to lead up to the cut? How can we make the cut safe? And what are some other things we can think about, some considerations as we're looking to make a cut next to a patient? So uh, take this information, use it, uh, train on it. And if you have any feedback from anything I did today or have anything to add to that, leave us a comment below. We'd love to hear from you. As always, stay vigilant and stay safe.